It's tabletop time. I'm Jazza. I'm Rob. I'm Jen. I'm Dave. Welcome to Ironspire, the capital city in Greydale in the land of Sonda. All this and much more exposition will be given to you in this world introduction episode. So basically the way we're treating world intros in this and future campaigns is the world intro is kind of an expedition exposition dump and character intros, but from episode one onwards, like reading any novel, you just are gonna jump straight into the action. But this will be there for people who really wanna know a little bit more of the context about the world, about the characters, and some of the hidden secrets, and also places you can check out where you can sink your teeth into further, which we'll get to in a moment. But uh, first of all, you might notice we have a pretty cool soundtrack. And if you're coming to this video from other episodes, worked very hard to curate a soundtrack like we did with a reboot and we're really proud of them so i just thought i'd let you know that i'm going to link in the description to the epidemic music playlist for ironspire so you can check those out if you like the music and you want to use them for your own content or campaigns otherwise we're excited to announce the launch of cogent 1.3 yeah so a lot of changes in this update uh, and some of the big spicy ones that people have been asking for for a while the big one is a campaign progression system so a suggested way of running your campaigns and rewarding skill points and attribute points and uh, also some cool little things like uh, job milestones and ways to progress your character in multiple ways uh, which we're using for this campaign so yeah. it'll be a fun way to go through it. For those of you who don't know, Cogent Roleplay is the system we're using. So like Dungeons and Dragons, but very focused on storytelling and also mechanics don't get in the way of that. So that's the point of it. And a piece of exciting news is that the character sheets have also been digitally remade and presented to you to use freely uh, on World Anvil, who is the sponsor of this video and this campaign, which I'm very excited about. We're going to dive into that later. I'm going to show you where to find that stuff and how to use it. It's very, very fun and it's all there. But let me first begin by showing you something from a while back. Seven years ago, I... Uh, I came up with the the world and and wow. races of. So this has been out for oh, wow. seven years. It's like this, seven years. Wow. This was specifically that picture I drew and the other pictures that I showed you. I just I wanted to set the tone because I uh, I started world building Sunder uh, and Ironspire seven years ago, but I had cogent wasn't a thing yet. I but I was playing with the dice pool mechanics and trying to figure out like a world that I, I wanted to build. And, and this is what it turned into. I'm really excited to be launching that with you all here today and, and sharing it for the first time. Can you go back one more time? I want to see that. I want to see the proto cold. Very this cool. Is, yeah, this is the first cold. And I'm guessing the Thanissians is the first one. Yeah, that's Thanissians. Yeah, nice. Yeah. I think my favorite thing about it is the fact that it's like 362 weeks ago. Yeah. Um, but if you go back to images, it's like, I might even stream us playing. Yeah. I yeah, like yeah. That. That's good. Yeah, there you go. And Mind here it is. This is before tabletop time existed, before Cogent was made, and um, it was obviously a dream. So mm. I'm really excited to, to be realising this mm. with you all. And I think the reason I've been really nervous is because it's been mine and it's been this thing I want to be perfect to share. But I'm really excited to be sharing it now, and I'm, I'm really hoping that you all have a lot of fun with me, and that's the whole purpose of it. So I'm really looking forward to doing that with you all. So in doing so, I want to start off by reading you a little world introduction just to set the tone, give you a bit of a vibe for the place and the peoples uh, and the history. 782 years ago, King Grayson banished all competing tribes and clans from the land he claimed as his own. The nation of Greydale was born and has since reigned as the supreme military and trade power of the continent. But those banished fledgling tribes have since survived and even flourished in their various territories. Far to the east, across the glimmering sea, Thanissia has become a land of culture and plenty. It is now a matriarchal society rich with art, wine, and knowledge. It has deep roots throughout other nations. As Thanissians have ventured out offering their service and skills in exchange for what they value above all, knowledge. Far to the west, Beyond the desert of the Endel Plains, the Empire of Felmore has become rich beyond measure. In large part due to their trade of gold from the coldish clans of the Mountain Crown to the south, their cities sprawl with towering structures of sandstone and concrete, and even common Phelan citizens are adorned in silks, gold, and fine Phelan glass. The Phelan have bred their own slave race from the prodigy of the giant cold from the Mountain Crown. A breed they call the Phelan Cool. 
handled like livestock, the average adult failing pool stands between seven to eight feet tall and is heavily muscled. They're responsible for fi building Felmore's greatest structures, sustaining its agricultural efficiency, and are now rumored to have become the most imposing military force in all of Sunder, held by a leash in the hands of the Phelan Emperor. Greydale is now facing threats to their power from without and from within. The annexed northern region of Greydale, the Barrows, is home to the Barrowan people who have slowly been developing technologies and trade relationships, allowing them to recover independence from their Greydon oppressors. They are now demanding sovereignty. Far south on the outskirts of Greydale stands the Watchwood, headquarters of the cult of thieves called Watchers, who have over the last few hundred years spread throughout Greydale like a plague. Now, there are Watchers in every town and city in Greydale, and some rumored to be in seats of power seeking to spread their tendrils over new territories and riches. Despite these challenges to their power, Greydale stands strong in large part due to the unrelenting loyalty of its people to their King Rendrick III. A city in which he dwells, Iron Spire, named after the colossal structure at its helm, dramatically pierces the sky and casts a shadow over the land every day when the sun rises. That was my dramatic introduction. <laughs> so, our story begins with a few of these outsiders. So I think it'd be fun before we dive into the world itself, now that you've had a bit of a sampling of the different regions and cultures and attitudes, uh, to introduce our player characters. Maybe let's start off with Dave, who's playing a Barrowan, who is the closest to Iron Spire geographically uh -huh. uh, in his origins. That is, take it from that here, is sir? me, as I don't at all uh, try and quickly bring up the map <laughs> so I can find the map. Uh, okay, so what you do is you click the link in the description or you go to itstabletoptime.com slash sunder if and that will take you to the World Anvil page. If you're watching on Twitch, you can scroll down and it's got Campaign Sunder with a link to supplementary content. Beautiful. Love that. My town that you put on the map is in on the map. Uh, it is. You need Isn't to zoom it? in. Yeah. No, 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 no. no. Okay, no. let me show you. Let me show you some of the cool bloody features. Of the See, here's this home page, right? Yeah. I go on the bloody map. Here it is. Look at the look at the map, right? Yeah. See this little. See the layers. Mm -hmm. so that's just major towns that are ticked here. Oh. Right. So you can oh, click spice. small settlements and locations. My hometown. It's an interactive, sick ass map. You could also, if you want to, just divide by regions and see where the resources are coming from. You know, that's just just little things if you want to just like. That's yeah. bloody good, mate. It's pretty bloody, pretty cool. Pretty bloody. My bloody town is color. there. It's it a is. small settlement. Uh, and your was yours, Felbrook? Yeah, it was. There you go. So it's tell us, okay. tell us about so your. So now I'll go so. into me professionally explaining who I am. All right. All right, everyone, I'm Delvin, and I'm from a little town called Felbrook. You see, when I was young, we grew up on the river, living a good life out in the plains. But my family was pushed north by the conflict into the barrows themselves, where I lived a life of relative poverty and squalor. But I wasn't going to settle on that being my lot. No, I had a natural aptitude for, well, business. Hard times create clever people, and I found a way to make money buying and selling, eventually becoming a merchant of considerable renown given my years. And that's where you find me, 26 years old and sitting on more money than I ever thought I'd see. But uh, a lot of that money comes from the deserts, and that's where I've been recently. Do you want me to go further? Love it. Edge of the desert, I'd say, yeah, right here in this trading town, Felton. So uh -huh. you've been back and forthing between Felton and the Barrows uh -huh. uh, in a very high-paid trade relationship, uh -huh. working with various people and f quite fruitful, especially given your origins. Uh -huh. It's very exciting. A little bit of that ingenuity out of yeah. darkness. Love it. Welcome. Thank you. Delvin. <laughs> All right, Catalina. Oh, mine's not going to be nearly as cool as Dave's. Yeah, that was really good. Right. Either. <laughs> yeah, just ju just dive in, guys. It's That's okay. It. It's fun. Okay, let me just bring up my character. So I am playing Catalina, and I am a Tunisian. I don't know where my hometown is. I don't think we came up with one, but the capital. The capital. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a 26 year old female. 
Um, I have a mother that is into the politics um, in the Nisia. Um, a long time ago, I I did have a father and he was very much into um, music. He was a bit of a bard. And then unfortunately, one day he did pass away um, and leaving his only possession, which was a harp. Um, and so I carry out that around with me all the time. It's my most prized possession. Um, as my job, I am a trade and a barter. I trade in art and knowledge, which is pretty much what Phoenicia is known for. Um, other than that, that's pretty much all she has to say. My pictures, her profile pictures there, mm. as you guys can see. Great. Yeah. Do you want to share a little bit about the uh, the circumstances around your father's passing? Sure. So um, we get a lot of trade um, where I'm from um, and there's a bit of blood money behind um, my past. So basically my father was out doing some trade um, as well. He was on a ship and it got boarded by the watch um, and unfortunately he was killed along with a bunch of other people um, and we in return got a lot of our uh, treasure and knowledge as well but Unfortunately, they were... You lost your father. They were perished, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It's a bit sad. A little bit sad. Yeah. Yeah. So you got blood money, is that... Yeah. That's a, a little feature in the new it Trojan is. rules. It is. It's a <laughs> quirk, quirk of, of wealth, wealth yeah. yeah. You got one yourself, sir. I do. I do. I haven't talked about that. No, do you want to mention it? Ah, uh, yes. Um, Delvin's got a bit of a soft spot. I, I have a patron. Well, I am a patron of the arts. My my mother, she's um an artist and... She's good, but damn, there's no market for it. So whenever uh, things get a bit tight around the home, I grease the wheels of industry and make sure someone's after a portrait so her art can get appreciated where it should be. That's really cool. It's uh, Yeah, the Quirks of Wealth is it was actually Dave's suggestion for the next Cogent update, which basically enables a D20 system to roll for the chance to... Well, in exchange for an extra commerce point, so both of you are more wealthy than average but they rolled and they were their quirks of their wealth is uh, David has a patron and Jen has acquired her money through blood money, which yep. means, you know, it's a, it's, it's a fun way to just add more character motivation and story um, behind the build that you create. Yeah. Okay. I think before we move on from, yeah, sorry, we oh, I want to wrap up a little bit about diving into that a little bit um, because your passions mm-hmm. are a little are not allowed in Phoenician culture. Yeah, so it's just kind of, it's against the law, I would say, or just it's kind of un- very not looked, frowned upon, very, yeah. very frowned upon to, um, for a female to pursue the arts. They're very much more, um, have strong positions and the males typically go with the more sort of what we would claim as the more feminine positions. Um, but, yeah, so having a instrument on me is probably... Something I want to keep a bit secret, but we'll explore that throughout the role play. I also wanted to mention as well that I, Catalina has an extreme prejudice to um, cultures that demoralise females. So she's very much a feminist um, and is strong in the belief of equality for all, not so, there, so she's kind of, even in her own culture, she finds it a little bit strange. Yeah, it's, a, it's the um, Phoenician default, especially in the with the powerful, mm. is quite, is sort of, the extreme to the other extent, where in a lot of other cultures, especially the coldish, mm. um, it's, you know, brutally, you know, unequal against females, but also in high Phoenician society, yeah. um, basically it's unfair in a similarly opposite direction. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, in Phoenicia, men don't have the same opportunities women do, yeah. and women are seen as the leaders and teachers, so. Yeah. Um, but you you want to be an artist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's, I think, a reason that she left as well, to go trade, explore um, and to kind of broaden her horizons a bit to to see – she knows she can't change the world, but if she can start making things a little bit better, then that's good for her as well. So, Love it. Yeah. Welcome. Thanks. Catalina. Brick. <laughs> uh, we have a Phelan called in our party. Why don't you take us through some of your origin, your story, your character and personality and motivations? I am Brick. I think that that about does it. Uh, Welcome, Brick, to to the party. I am Phelan Cold Warrior. It's my life has been devoid of the pleasures of normal livelihoods. Uh, 
I am warrior. I fight. I protect. And well, that's it. So I'm excited to explore the world and its vices uh, and experience with it uh, and, and the viewers. Love it. Welcome. Um, I like that voice modulator is perfect. <laughs> but I think like maybe to dive a little deeper, let's do it out of character. Uh, okay. Okay. But uh, yeah, tell us a, a little bit about, um, I think it, it might be good to first introduce that uh, Brick will be joining the party in episode one. We're actually going to role play in episode zero uh, technically today in stream when we open this up, but that'll be available to patrons only. So those of you who follow us on Patreon, you can see our basically practice run, but also our way that some of our characters first meet and also get to experience being the characters for the first time. So we can do episode one. I'm so with glad we're confidence. playing today. I was thinking yeah. like, please, we have yeah. to play today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm pumped. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll do that. But I think it also is sort of worth mentioning that the view to experience the world isn't something that you necessarily have at the start of the yeah, campaign. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, as I was saying, he, he's lived a, a shel- not a sheltered life. Restricted. He, restricted yeah. life. He's been used as a tool um, and this is probably the first <laughs> opportunity for him to, to branch out and explore the world of, of, of Sunda and I guess I inspire. Um, Do you want to explain Brick, I love the name? Brick, uh, <laughs> he's property. He doesn't have a name. Brick yep. is... A, a nickname he was given because he's about as useless as a brick um, by itself. At least, like that's that's the the meaning of it. Whether or not it's true, I mean, I guess it's in comparison to the other Phelan Cole that he would have been related to. Yeah. With. Yeah. Um, I just love the idea that you said he's sheltered, and it's like a very different concept of shelter. It's like, thing. oh, you've never seen, you've never like slept in a comfortable bed, but you're yeah. nice and sheltered. Seen a man's head get caved in? Sure, many yeah. times. <laughs> yeah. We were obviously. But he's lived a very innocent, yeah, quiet life. It's very yeah. sheltered. We make sure he hasn't eaten like flavor before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's pretty much it. Yeah, that, that about sums it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm actually I'm really excited to 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 play him. To be honest, mm. I think it's going to be a nice little challenge. I'm I'm really excited too about the party dynamic because I think with Catalina, Catalina and Brick being very much outsiders and with Delvin being Barrowin, so technically more of an outsider than most within uh, Greydale, um, I'm excited for the experience of everyone sort of, feel, you know, feeling their way through the world a bit together with our viewers and uh, I'm excited to see where that leads. I'm excited to watch a Greydale citizen wet their drawers when I walk in with Brick. <laughs> I'm, so I'm looking forward to being cheeky constantly. <laughs> My whole character is just basically cheek and nothing to, nothing behind it. I do not wish to save you again. <laughs> so you will have noticed that uh, we've been flicking around in this little map here, which I'm very excited to dive into a little bit more detail. World Anvil has sponsored our campaign. I'm so excited about this. Uh, I actually approached them first because I had started building... Uh, this whole campaign in World Anvil. And the more I dived into it, the more I had to work with. And every tool I learned, there were like five more that m enabled me to co-link and then create more. So when you go to the Zun Sunder homepage, this is what you are greeted with. And this is going to be built out more and more and more. Basically, I started off with the timelines. So that was the first feature. I was like, I had a timeline that was just like a badly put together, like Google Docs, thing but I knew there were like different cultures so I wanted a timeline for different cultures and when they interacted it was really messy whereas here I have one beautiful timeline for the history of Sunder which presents all of the timelines together so you can read the whole history and chronology of the entire continent if you have time and <laughs> will to or if you're particularly interested in one culture let's say the Barrows you can click on that and it has an article and it has its own timeline as well. So if I go to the Sunder homepage, down to the timelines, I can go to the Barrows and it goes to the Barrow and timeline. All of these are in that master timeline, uh, but it's a, just a good way to be able to, if you wanna learn a bit more about where one of the characters came from, you can do that to your heart's content. Uh, they also now officially support cogent roleplay character sheets. Uh, so let me show you this actually, if I go to uh, a guide to Sunder in my world codex, player options, playable races. And look at this, I've got different character templates. Phoenician player template, click. Oh my God. So this is the, 
I freaking love this love art. Love the art so much. This is uh, by Alicia Lowry, who's done a lot of the character art commissions and the uh, that landscape on the homepage. Basically, you can really sink your teeth into this. If anyone wants to play in Sunder or Ironspire, please be my guest that I'm making this to share. So please have fun, play with your friends. And I uh, to facilitate that, if you click on view on a character sheet, and you can open the character sheet. If you scroll down, you can see stat block type cogent role playing. Click on that and you can scroll through all of the com community made uh, cogent role play character sheets. So if you make them, you can share them and make them public. But I've also made a whole bunch I haven't even put in the public listed uh, <laughs> thing yet. So there's all the, like you could be a Phoenician teacher, there's artist musician, and these are basic templates that you can add your character points on top of just to act as a guide. I've been a little bit obsessive about this and I've had a lot of fun. So please feel free to have a bit of fun yourself. It really does let you sink your teeth into everything. And not only for me as a, a game maker for this, this campaign, for you as viewers, you can go dive into it, but also for players, uh, they all have their character sheets. We can share messages and images as we play. It's really, really cool. Um, there's article making and linking. So for example, I've got Phoenician template here, and then I've got sublisted articles, uh, Phoenician bonus vocations. So everything can be super in interconnected, uh, which I really love. I, I am gonna have so much fun when I have time, which I never have, but I still can't arm myself building out things like the world atlas sorry world encyclopedia <laughs> if i go to the um fauna and flora and check out the uh animals i, I got one first listing here this is the drakow <laughs> the desert creature of felmore that Aww. uh they're there's well art for it yeah this is the drakow that i commissioned that artwork it looks tasty it's, that's so cool it's very cool so their horns and uh spikes are used in concrete and phalan glass recipes something else i need to jump in on and show you guys is the storyteller screen uh which i can't really show you guys much of because it's a little bit more Spoily. of the secret side of thing but i've got character portraits so i can click those and bring up profiles without showing much uh, i can so show you that i can plan a lot and quickly access it quickly archive it if i want to make a character super quickly i can quickly type up a character name and blah 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 if you come across someone i improvise and save it <laughs> so that later when you're like hey that town guard we spoke to for three seconds two episodes ago what was their name again i can be like ha ha i remember it I'll have to figure out their accent again, but I'm gonna point is and, it's- I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you to do that. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> Crap, I've opened up the gates. Uh, so anyways, I'm obviously getting carried away with this and having so much fun and I really hope my players enjoy being in it, but also you as viewers enjoy uh, viewing it, listening to it, and also diving into it. If you want to build a world, go check out World Anvil. They actually have a deal for you. It's their highest level of discount is 40% off of all 12 month memberships. So you can sign up for free and you can uh, you can check out the character sheets, you can join a campaign and explore all of their content. But if you want to use their world builder or really sink your teeth in some of, some of the features, 40% off of all 12 month memberships is available if you go to worldanvil.com slash Ironspire to make use of that and use the code Ironspire to claim 40% off. Awesome. Cool. Amazing. That's very, very cool. exciting. I'm excited for the foundations that's been laid, but I'm really excited that this feels like the start of a world we're all going to build together. Mm -hmm. Huge thank you, World Anvil, uh, worldanvil.com slash Ironspire to go check that out in more detail. So I think that covers a pretty solid foundation. I think I'm just going to leave that door open now for the rest of it, uh, of this video slash interaction. We're going to want to jump in episode zero pretty soon, I reckon. Mm. Um, I think we should do some out of character, just like basic character, like des yeah. we didn't describe our characters visually and stuff like that. It's probably Great. worth doing. Let's do it. Yeah. Do you want to lead the way? And we'll go, we'll go cl clockwise right. again. Delvin is, um, well, I mean, you can see his portrait. That's a pretty good visual. Uh, he's inspired by Jim from The Office. He's about six foot two. Like, he's a big, friendly looking guy. Um, he wears lots of, like, merchanty, baggy, quilted clothing. He seems a little bit self conscious about maybe his appearance because um, he's just a pretty average guy. Um, so, yeah, he, he, he likes to wear comfortable trading clothes and, um, Otherwise, he travels light. Like, he often goes with a cart, but he, f he doesn't have a big adventuring rucksack mm. with, like, bed rolls. Why would you stay in a tavern? Who goes camping? What, are you an animal? <laughs> um, so, he's, yeah, he's very much that kind of guy. Um, but, yeah, overly tries to be friendly to people. Um, so, he's a little bit unusual in that mm. he's wealthy, but he's because he's come from hardship, he sees hardship in other people and he where he can um, 
we'll try and change that. I love that. that. Yeah. So I have a second quirk of wealth as well, though. Yes. Which is an area where I won't compromise. And that is basically um, I expect the best from something. And the thing I randomly rolled for that was um, was kind of like eating. And, and I'm extending that a little bit to like standard of living. Yeah. So I do not want to go back to the caves. Like I... I scratched and clawed my ways out of uh, out of the barrows. So you won't settle for less than first class, basically. Yeah, and, and first class, I'm not going to have a big cry. Like, Delvin's not going to have a cry if it's not first class, but it's got to be first class relative to what's available. Yeah. So even in a small town, I'll stay in the tavern, not the stable. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to be like, oh, this bed isn't plush, because yeah. even a bed is decent. Yeah. But I'm not going to be like, oh, let's save some coin and sleep in a tent. I'll be like, there's a tavern right there. Or I'm going to go talk to the mayor and see if I can... If it's Breath of the Wild, it's always that expensive bed option. Yeah, no every time. <laughs> if the option's there, I'll take the, the first class option. Yeah. Uh, and I won't, like, I'll definitely turn my nose up at the worst option of everything and I'll try and live better. Love it. Mm. Great. All right, Catalina, give us a visual description and maybe a little bit about your... Uh habits and, and mm -hmm. personalities and stuff. Sure. Um, so Catalina, she was inspired by um, a Final Fantasy character called Fang. Um, she's very tanned, wears a lot of like loose clothing, which is very typical in where she's from. Um, wears this beautiful purple, like royal purple sash. Um, but she's also not super, like she doesn't wear a lot of jewellery or anything. She's kind of very modest um, and just kind of tries to blend in. She doesn't want to stand out too much while in her travels. Mm -hmm. um, she's very much a protector as well. So she, and she's happy to get her hands dirty. She's not too princy. She probably would be quite happy camping out or roughing it up. She doesn't mind too much um, if that's an option, but same sort of deal as well. She'll probably want to sleep in a tavern, but either way, she's not going to say no to sleeping out. Um, she's also has a, um, a couple of skills in, um, a small hand weaponry because she's good at keeping on her toes. So she, because she's a barter and a trader, she's not too, does she's happy to get her hands dirty if she needs to? I was going to ask you actually, because I didn't get a chance to see your final character sheet. Mm. Did you have as many points in your trading skill? So what I did in the end was I put um, that trade barter vacation up to three. Yeah. Art was two and small weapon is two. Okay, cool. So I make them e equal. So she is just as knowledgeable about art and um, other stuff. Mm -hmm. I'll put something else that I forgot with, um, as she is using a small weapon. So she's That's quite happy so funny. to- That's so funny. I love that. <laughs> yeah, so she needs yeah. to cut and run, then she's, she'll do it. It's always been very practical and much more connected, I guess, than yeah. she was raised to be told to be. Exactly. Yeah. As a Thanissian um, politician, though, she does have minus one in survival, so we'll see how she goes. <laughs> but she's, yeah, she's, she maybe she thinks she knows how to survive in the desert, but maybe might need a hand That's every awesome. now and then. <laughs> That's uh, that might also be a good point to touch on uh, something that people who have been using Cogent may not be familiar with the new update. What we've done is we've folded proficiencies into a subset uh, as voca. They're now called vocational skills, and they're sort of nested within vocations. So the way it works is, um, Jen, you have three points in your vocation, which is called? Uh, trade barter. Trade barter. So you can decide for it to be a profession. It could be a uh, baker or, or guard. Um, mm -hmm. And then inside that you nest your combat abilities or your, you know, so your combat ability of knife, you've learned to use that in protecting yourself on the road and all this stuff. Yep. Um, so basically, yeah, the way that works is that the vocation is the cap the more points you have in the vocation, the more points you can have in the skills inside of it. And then those are the skills that you do checks with, like a, a skill check, um, but the vocation skills are still assist skills. Hope that clears things up for people who are yeah. interested. For in example, update. a vocation baker could use their vocation to <laughs> assist in a perception <laughs> check if it was to perceive <laughs> the scent of baked Ginger goods. <laughs> useful. I love it. Yeah. Niche, but useful. Yeah. Cool. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, no and maybe a uh, little bit about your musicianship. Um, how how much do we do? We want to out of like in this sort of talk? Do you just want to talk about magic and? Stuff I, th I think I think a little bit, yeah. Okay, like I th yeah. So, Catalina has the ability to use magic, um, which is at this point in time, a. She doesn't know that it's magic. She's not sure what it is. It's For her, it's the harp that she has and it's the spirit of her father and she uses the harp every day and she tunes to it um, 
but she just thinks that that's her dad pretty much. And whenever mm. these these good things happen because of her playing her harp or because it's with her is purely either coincidental or she just knows it's her dad. Yeah. Um, so to make that connection hasn't quite happened yet because she's just unaware of it or she just doesn't think much of it. Yeah. Um, I do think yeah. like, yeah, I, I think it's just worth touching on because roles will be introduced yeah. relatively early and it might get confusing if we're trying to be too mysterious about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, but yeah, no, I, th- I think the way you wanted your character sort of to build up into that was to have sen- essentially rituals of like the way you mm. play every day and it's also this connected thing. Yeah, exactly. So she has to, I mean, I mentioned this a couple of sessions ago, but every morning she does spend like a good half an hour to an hour tuning and taking care of it and making sure it looks all nice and pristine and playing with it and everything. So she needs to do that. It's like a part of her, like her ability, like she needs to do it. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Thank you. And then finally. Uh, brick. So Brick yep. is a very large, he's six foot 11 is what I have, but I'm not sure if we settled on any, on a specific height. Uh, but six and six foot 11. That's, uh, isn't that, yeah, it's like short for a failing goal. <laughs> yep. Uh, two and a half foot wide at the shoulders. Mm. So very big, very bulky. Yeah. Um, uh, very common to the failing, well, it's not very common. It's pretty much every failing cold has those deep black glasses to pr- protect their irises because they yeah. are quite sensitive. Having uh, being a half breed of people that live in capes for their entire lives. Uh, That's so. It might be worth mentioning too that those glasses are. Uh, other cultures don't know how to produce phalan glass. Yeah, and it's one of the ways that the phalan have sort of utilised and been able to control. I think their culture grew out, especially with things like the drakau that I showed that picture of earlier, these big beastly desert creatures that they had cultivated and bred far before they came across the coldish and start, started getting into the human slave trade. Yeah, um, yeah they knew how to wrangle big beasts. So yep. all of a sudden there comes this like human breed, so to speak, uh, that they transformed it to their uses as far as guards and city builders, uh, but kept... Keep, keep them very oppressed. And one of the ways they do that is to control uh, them through their reliance through using phalan glasses. Yeah. Because they're cave, they're like, yeah, the phalan coal are coldish essentially, um, meaning they, they have evolved through some of the aid of sort of magical forces in the world to survive in these deep mountain caves that are very hot and very dark. Uh, so high resistance to so heat, even, yeah, very right. perceptive in the dark, quite easily blinded by light. <laughs> so those glasses sort of normalise it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, now, as a, a general Phelan Coldish slave, uh, he would have been trained in a variety of things, be it as a workhorse or as a warrior. Uh, we've specified in this that Brick uh, is a bodyguard or would have been trained as a bodyguard or a warrior, um, which means he's got uh, an affinity for large and reach weapons uh, and some skills in crowd control under his vocation. Love it. Yeah. Um, I don't know what else. Cool. Weapon, did we? I haven't decided on one yet. We can decide it now. I think we need to pick it before episode yeah. zero. So uh, we were having a discussion that there, there's this coldish, like when I say, uh, to avoid confusion, when I say cold or coldish, I'm talking about the beasts in the mountains. Mm. Phelan coal or coal are the sort of yeah. slave race to the Phelan. Um, so... The coldish use something called a coldish pick, which is a huge steel giant double-sided pick thing. And Rob was like, "I want one of those." And at first, I was like, "Oh, okay." But no, actually, realistically, the the Phelan don't like anything that Looks is too beasty. Yeah, yeah. Just, which is actually why they dress the Phelan coal in silks and colours and all this stuff so that they look fairly regal, you know, as their protectors. Uh, how about like a I don't want to say pole arm, like a yeah, pole like, or like a. It's a, like a pole hammer, or is a cold, coldish pick is a two headed pick, right? And they yeah. furiously mine yeah. and kill really fast. I know it's epic and cool. All I can picture is the lightsaber kid <laughs> 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 making me like very. I'm just uh, watching a cool movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can someone please animate a coldish giant in the same moves as the lightsaber kid? That would be great. Yeah. Uh, we'd appreciate that. Almost like a staff <laughs> with a blade on the end. But yeah. I think stylistically, I'm thinking like, because I'm looking at the, the Phelan. What does a Phelan on a guard wield? Swords. Swords. Okay. I can see it in there. Character a fo- art. Phelan. Phelan. Yeah. So would a 
They're, Phelan don't I can wield. See a, I can see a surely. surely. So, but you mean Phelan Cole? No, I mean fa- surely there's like honor guard of the leaders, like a uh, uh, Phelan Cold. So this, all of them. So they trust them that implicitly. They that, control them that effectively. That they, there's no Phelan at all that are like. It's no. uncanny how good they are at corralling these people and beasts like animals, like a manipulative and. But there is no question. Okay. It's like super cult, like uh, drink the Kool Aid level control. Like, okay. wow. I yeah. was thinking just, more just like as a the baseline. Like, you're an outlier. Ish. Playing a Phelan Cold is like, yeah, an um, outlier. Um, but if you, it, an actual Phelan Cold is basically a, a mindless life. <laughs> like, a, like a six foot pole with a flame shaped blade at the tip. That sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's, that's what that's I, I was cool. hoping that there'd be like, a position where it's it's more of like an honor. Th- it's not actually a realistic art. And then I was like, use whatever they will get. Yeah, no, they, uh, everyone in power is uh, in power because they have money and control. Okay, and they, their sure. whole culture is built around all of that. They're they they don't like combat. They're not combatants. That's yep. British. And a shield. They leave the British things to the brutes, but they control the brutes. So okay. they're very good at at controlling the brutes. <laughs> a shield. If you have a reach weapon, I think like Spartan. I'm gonna. I'm their, gonna say no. A spear in there. Hold on. I'm gonna say no, oh. especially because to the Phelan, the col- the Phelan cold are expendable. It's like oh. you know, okay. <laughs> but it's never been okay. a problem. Okay. Like yeah, like, these things need to defend themselves. Like y- yeah, you're okay. a monster. <laughs> you're That's huge. Fine. That's fine. Just the spear with the weird flame shape. A tower shield that would look a, like cute. It's got a bit sort of, of stab, bit of slash. Cool. You can always get one later. So big true. sword on a stick. Kind I, of. I want to draw what I have in mind, but I we'll, can't draw. We'll, we'll, yeah. get, we'll get some art done. It'll be cool. All right. I oh think... Oh, uh, I hope I don't have to get in a fight. I've got this knife I use for peeling apples. <laughs> I, uh, I think that's sort of a... That's Wait, where... I'm being stupid. I've got brick. <laughs> You've got a knife. Uh, well, got you've got a, a hammer. <laughs> a hammer, a walking hammer. Uh, I don't fight with a blade. I fight with bricks. Oh, you don't want to see what that means, I can promise you. <laughs> the wall, Kool-Aid guy wall explodes. What are they talking through. about getting in trouble, Delvin? I can't help but need to show the coldish. <laughs> so freaking cool, especially the character art. My goal. Hey. That's what the coldish pick looks like. That's what the coldish mountain people look like who aren't really part of this. I think my favourite thing about that is is that it doesn't look too big in his hands, but that thing is like five foot tall. Uh, Taller. If that was upright, yeah, that's like six, six and a half for sure. Love it. Yeah. (laughs) It's freaking huge. You wouldn't be able to, you'd have to have like, I think you have to have two strengths to hold it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's insane. It's, it, they're crazy. Anyway, uh, that wraps up all the character intros. I think basically on the tail end of this, I'm just happy to open it up to basically setting up where episode zero is going to start off, not episode one, because we're going to lead into episode zero from here. Um, and if we have any questions about the world building or how we got up to there, now is the time to to give that some clarification. We can cross some T's and dot some I's together mm-hmm. before we jump into some role play, which is happening today. What the hell? Oh, oh my God. Yeah. So uh, maybe maybe bringing up that uh, world map that I opened, had opened a second ago might be helpful. My bottom lip is intact for now. I am missing an ear though. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Where did it go? <laughs> well, I assume some desert creature ate it after it fell off. Um, what do you mean it fell off? Well, it was cut off. Oh, and that make, that makes him. There was no use putting it back on. <laughs> um, yeah, so just as a bit of an orientation, this is the geographic stuff that everyone in Sunder would understand. In the middle here is Greydale, the center of the universe in their eyes. Um, it's the most bountiful place in the whole continent and has been the centre of trade, but now there's a lot of independent trade and power mongering sort of happening and people are getting more and more powerful. Uh, up north in the Barrows, they are more connected with Phoenicia and Felmore than Great Allah, and they're sort of fighting over that connection. Uh, the Barrows uh, and the Barrowan people are very clever when it comes to engineering. There are surface and subsurface dwelling people. They have some city town, sorry, uh, surface... City, cities and towns, but they're actually mainly 
in tunnels and caverns that they've dug out in the cold northern mountains. Um, they uh, have various mining inventions, which are very clever, that uh, Phoenicians are studying, especially because in Phoenicia they're uh, starting to utilise some of that engineering knowledge and archive it. There is this passage of sea between uh, Iron Spire and Phoenicia's capital, White Top, which is a very common tra trade route. It's called the Glimmering Sea, because a long time ago, and this is all in the timeline, I'll give you the TLDR, uh, the people who were banished from Great Owl were sort of got, wandered off, this batch went into the woods, uh, and then they subdivided and the Phoenicians ended up here. But there was sort of like this... You know, they hadn't seen each other for hundreds and hundreds of years until eventually when White Top was built, which is a city of sh white sheets and glimmering things. The, every morning when the sun would rise, it would reflect on these sheets and make the sea glimmer and spark like almost blinding light for a period of time every day, which eventually was explored. And the prodigal passage across the glimmering sea was established and trade with Phoenicia was established. So that's a fun sort of the prodigal return of uh, Phoenicia to to Ironspire many hundreds of years later after they were banished. But it's worth mentioning that because the watchwood down here uh, is where the watchers often sail out and intercept those trade routes and they're very good at stealing, uh, which is what happened and killing to people's poor fathers, Catalina's apparently. father. Yeah. Yeah. How dare they? They were inter intercepted. And it's uh, when Great Owl trades, they're aware that it's almost a 50-50 as to whether they're going to get the stuff or not. It's that bad. I have a very quick question. Yes. Um, could you describe the architecture for the, architecture for the different um, That's a capitals? That's great question. Because yeah. I'd like to know if what, yeah, one's more medieval or one's more... I, I would imagine the Nisi is more Greek. Very Mediterranean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, like, that sort of, um, that sort of layered cities, uh, very stone, very... Uh, built around vineyards and all that stuff. Um, but also their linens uh, are a big part of their export and pride uh, and their paper. Um, but specifically their white linens are the purest uh, that can be found. So, which is why white top is a point of pride because it's really durable and strong and they can keep it clean somehow, even, you know, even though it's exposed to yeah. weather and stuff. So, um, yeah, very, very, uh, very Mediterranean um, looking. Um, and then Iron Spire and the Barrows. Iron Spire is your typical sort of like King's Landing esque, yep. um, except for I think the thing to note about Iron Spire is it's massive. It's like three capitals surrounding a capital. Iron Spire itself is a very hard to get into place. Even the wealthy traders and blah blah blah, they sort of are on these outskirt city ports. Um, so if you look around here, we've got the Bartwell Keep, which is more the military district. We have the Commons, which is more the trade district, and then Carry Pass, which is sort of the travel district uh, and messengers. And Iron Spire Capital proper is far more uh, exclusive. And the Spire is massive. It's massive. It's hard to even describe. But you can see it from all the way on the other side of the the land and even to when you start crossing the mountain it's like it pierces the horizon and anyone who's gotten close to it it feels like it's closer than it is it's so bloody big does that mean Pete, you have a general um sense of direction as well if you can tell like in that area if you're like oh cool the spires to my left therefore i know i'm facing i think yeah that's a very common way of seeing things especially i think it probably doesn't help the great and sense of superiority and being the center of the universe because they, they it's like this pinpoint of like this is the is center it? of everything that matters so they actually act that way as well the further out from iron spire you are the more casual people are about the rules but actually uh the following and loyalty to the king is more and more fanatical and, uh, I guess, overseen the closer you get to the spire. They were a bit uh, jealous of the shining Phoenician city, so they made themselves a little bit of a compensation tower to make up for it. A hundred percent. It's a giant penis. Um, <laughs> the guards, there are three <laughs> types of guards. There's the grey guard, the iron guard and the spire guard. Uh, and their helmets get more pointy the more special they are. <laughs> so they're, they're commonly referred to as pricks by people who <laughs> don't like them, but be careful to not be Love overheard. It. Yeah. Um, it. it is sort of like an inside joke. You would never be heard by a great gray, a and saying out loud that they're dickheads. <laughs> Story goes in the barrels that the Graydons thought the Thinicians were flashing them, so they showed them right back. <laughs> 
Just um, making up canon for your I world. love it. <laughs> I love it. So uh, if I go back out to the Sunder world to continue your question, it was a really cool question, by the way. <laughs> but if anyone wants to make fan art, just putting it in the usual places is amazing. But it also is worth keeping in mind that everyone I've commissioned fan art from started off contributing community fan art. Uh, I really keep my eye out for, and not just like in this campaign and the other campaigns, people have different styles. Sometimes things are more environmental or futuristic or whatever. And yeah, we sort of catalog that stuff because we love to commission. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you make feel like making fan art, just yeah. keep that in mind, you know, because we keep an eye out for quality. Um, so down in the Watchwood, it's very much uh, an in extreme it's version of Robin Hood and his oh. Merry Men's cities is sort of treetop very much suspended and more built up than you could imagine but also very much built up out of stolen and uh commandeered goods mm -hmm. um so cities built out of like half sunken boats suspended in the treetops and all this stuff with it like yeah anyway uh, up north in the barrow lands the cities are very much what well, the, the the surface dwelling cities are very similar to Graydon towns just a bit smaller, I guess. Um, but then the cities in the mountains are fairly large uh, and cavernous. Think, what's that lost, like, um, in in Syria, that, like, city carved out of the mountains? It was in Indiana Jones. I oh, saw um, the one. Petra. Petra, thank you. Yeah, like oh, that, sort of dug into the mountains themselves and going in and quite cavernous. Um not too much like dwarves, but a little bit like dwarves. <laughs> um, and snowy, I'd imagine. The mountains Ooh. themselves are really extremely cool. cold and frozen, and inside the mountains are quite cold, but they figure out their own heating systems, and they live primarily, especially initially, off of bats. That's, that was their primary food source. <laughs> Got um, some bad news, guys. <laughs> and clothes, bat capes. <laughs> Uh, then across the desert, finally, uh, not finally, I should say, because we have the coldish, but we won't go deep into that. Uh, Felmore's capital, Earthend, is at the end of the earth and uh, is across a very hard to cross desert um, and is very large in terms of sandstone structures. It has exponentially grown in size in the last hundred or two hundred years since the coldish have been turned into laborers basically uh so think like yeah like square pyramids and giant um desert dwelling buildings um very stone carving sandstone uh and concrete is one of their greatest inventions they have a few very good inventions failing glass and then concrete is the other uh, really reputable, hard to replicate one, um, and it's because in large part of the mix of the some of the materials they get from the animals and plant life that are um, sort of more, uh, what's the word, located in the area. Mm. Last but not least, the coldish. There's little known about them. It's more that they're whispered about. The mountain crown or the coldish crown, as it's known, these three peaks uh, off in the distance, sort of looms in the distance behind everyone. Everyone's terrified of the cold dish, but they haven't really emerged or caused any trouble, except there have been whispers and rumours of conflict between Felmore and the cold. But that's all the layperson knows. Um, cool. I would venture a guess that uh, Brick probably knows a little more, but not a lot more. Um, but they don't like each other at all. <laughs> so we are the weaker version. Yeah. I think that's also a point to mention in wrapping it all up is I think one of the themes, one of the core running themes of this whole world and campaign is all of these cultures have very strong mm. uh, cultures of control and fear of the outsiders, control from within, of within, of their citizens, of, of resources, and fear mongering of outsiders and wanting what they have, which well, is power the, or wealth. The inverse, right, a little bit. It's like way? the Barrowin and the Phelan called are more the oppressed than the oppressor. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. More. Obviously, there'd be groups within yeah. them that are blah, blah, blah. That's a great point. Yeah. The Barrow so, and a, a kind of have been controlled by Graydon for a very long watches time. Watches the Nysia, I inspire Felmore, very much about power and control. And yeah, uh, then there are those who are <laughs> more controlled than mm. seeking control. So actually, more seeking freedom. The Barrowans are actively rebelling and trying to seek um, autonomy, where the Phelan Cola are basically programmed uh, and not as aware of that but there are some more and more uh outliers especially as the slave trade reaches the the barrows um 
for an Sorry. outbreak. You Hat. don't have to be a slave forever, my friend. How tall is Iron Spire? Huge. Very tall. How tall? T- uh, tall enough to fit your question. Now, shut up. <laughs> no, I, I have 11 tabs open working out how long a shadow can cast depending on an item. And if it reaches to Windermere, which is like 140 kilometres away, this tower has to be several kilometres tall. It's... Which would make it taller than any st- tower currently. It's, m- it's tall magically tall. I don't know. Yeah. If you look at the world landscape... Maybe the sun's brighter. And you look brighter. at the size of the spire... And yeah. the distance between towns, I think that answers your question. Okay. It is kilometres. What? Uh, I'm, I'm pumped. I'm pumped to jump into episode zero with you guys, which we're going to do immediately. But for those of you who are watching this, it will be available to our patrons uh, a few days after this comes out on the main channel. So feel free to follow us on Patreon uh, for many exciting exclusives and opportunities to create characters with us in various uh, role-playing games. Vote on one-shots and loads more. But most importantly... Uh, your support means the world to us. It enables us to do really cool stuff. And hopefully this video has given you a glimpse as to how we're aggressively utilizing that to give back to you as much as we can. Thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you in the story and in chapter one or chapter zero, if you're going to be there. And I guess until then, we'll see you later. Bye.